The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. A trip to the dictionary will reveal the fact that the word miracle comes from a Latin word meaning something wonderful. A miracle, as we all know, is a departure from the usual course of nature. Something happens that in our customary day-to-day living couldn't possibly happen. Yet in some strange way that most of us can't explain, it does happen. And when it does, it is indeed something to wonder at. George, what have you done? I don't know, but I can't keep it up much longer. That oil lamp is hanging up in the air, upside down. Without spilling its oil, without breaking, burning just as bright as it did before. Yeah, it's just hanging there, not attached to anything. Well, what's making it do that? I don't know, Charlie. Unless, unless, What? Unless I've just worked some kind of a miracle. Our mystery drama, The Man Who Could Work Miracles, was adapted from the H.G. Wells classic story, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Arnold Moss. It stars William Redfield... It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule, and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Within a few days, the 1890s would be no more. The U.S. was once again at peace. The Spanish-American War was over. Colonel Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders had discarded their colorful uniforms and, like everyone else, would soon be welcoming the promise of the first sparkling new year of the 20th century. Mike Brannigan's saloon is one of the few reputable oases in lower New York City, right off the notorious Bowery. It is early evening, and two men, George McWhorter, a bookkeeper at a local bank, and his close friend Charlie Dempsey, a motorman for the 3rd Avenue trolley system, are seated at Mike's bar, busily engaged in their second most favorite pastime, the match game. Which one do you pick this time, Charlie? Mm, Now, hold your arm out straight, George, so I can see what I'm doing. Like this? Like that. Uh, Let's see now. Uh... Of the three matches, you're holding your closed fist, which is the short one of the three. Uh, I pick uh, this one. Here, on my left. Open your hand, George. You lose again, pal. No. <laughs> it's the one in the middle. That's 11 straight in a row you've lost at two cents a game. <laughs> uh, hey, Mike, two more beers. And uh, Charlie's paying as usual. I just can't figure out how you do it. Well, no trick. Just concentration. Concentration? On on what? You just have to have enough of the will to win. I concentrate on your picking the wrong match. You pick the wrong match, and I win. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Could anything be simpler? Yeah, but you almost never lose. It's like you have some kind of (laughs) magical power. Oh, that's just so much nonsense, and you know it. I'm beginning to wonder. It may just be possible. It's a matter of mind over matter. My mind. And I'm sorry to say there's nothing magical about that, Charlie. If there were, I might be chief teller at the bank instead of second assistant bookkeeper. (laughs) What's more, Minnie, my wife, wouldn't be bothering me every minute to ask for a raise. You may have something here. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Drink your beer. To your good help, Charlie. And to Teddy Roosevelt's good help. And that will do (laughs) it. George. What you do with a match game, it's really out of this world. It's, it's almost like some kind of miracle. Miracle, indeed. Charlie, hmm? what exactly is your understanding of a miracle? Well, I don't know. A miracle is something that... Um, it's like... We... No, no, there is no such thing as a miracle, Charlie. A miracle is something that goes against the course of nature. 
What would seem to be happening isn't really happening at all. What seems to be happening is all a question of willpower, nothing else. You follow me? Uh, I'm doing my best. Well, let me show you what I mean. Now, take this oil lamp burning right here over our heads. What about it? Well, that lamp, in the natural course of events, couldn't possibly burn like that. If it were suddenly to find itself hanging upside down. Now, could it, Charlie? Well, no. The glass chimney would slip off and break, and the kerosene oil would spill out and pour all over Absolutely us. right. Now, if someone were to come along, say me, for instance, and stand right about here, just where I'm standing, and say to that lamp, Lamp, when I say so, you just turn upside down and hang there in the air. You with me, Charlie? I'm following every word. Hang there in the air without spilling the oil, without breaking, burning just as bright as before. <laughs> what do you think would happen? Well, nothing. Nothing would happen, but that, that doesn't prove You're that... right. Absolutely nothing would happen. And now I'm going to prove it to you. Now, be quiet, Charlie. I am about to concentrate on that lamp just as I do in the match game. With every ounce of my willpower. And still, nothing will happen. It's impossible. Right? I'm watching. All right. Lamp, turn upside down. George. Look at it. What on earth have you done? Oh, the lamp. It's turned upside down. Right in its place, and it's burning just as bright as before. I, I can't believe it. Neither can I. And I am concentrating with all my might. That's what's doing it. Concentration, my foot. Charlie, you are performing a miracle. I, I don't think I can keep this up any longer. You see that? Your eyes are about to pop right out of your head. But I have to let go. I can't concentrate any longer. It's... It's wearing me out. And the lamp is still up there, burning as bright as ever, upside down. It... Oh. I'm sorry. I just didn't have the strength of will to keep it up any longer. Oh, George, are you, are you all right? I'm fine. I'm a little weak, Charlie, but, but fine. I think I want to go home. I want to tell Minnie what happened. She'll never believe me when I tell her. Another cup of coffee, George? Uh, no, thank you, Minnie. Oh, you hardly touched your dinner. Well, I wasn't very hungry. Well, if you don't mind me saying so, George, you look terrible. Your face is still flushed, your eyes bloodshot. I, I know, I know. You want to talk about it? Well, what more is there to say? The lamp kept hanging there, upside down in space. Well, maybe there was something wrong with the wet. No, oh, it fell because I got tired from all that concentrating. Oh, but that doesn't prove anything. It goes to prove that... Minnie, will you bring me one of my Christmas cigars, please? Mm, might I ask how many beers you and Charlie had before this thing happened? Here's your cigar. Well, Charlie was right there. He saw it, too. Well, that's what I mean. Do you suppose... You could do it again. Make a lamp burn upside down? Wasn't once enough? Uh, uh, can I have a match? Well, just to find out whether or not you... Oh, George, I forgot. There isn't a match in the house. I forgot to buy some. I I'll go next door to the Hendersons and... There's no matches in the house. I must have a match right now. No. Minnie, would you take a look? Right here in my hand. A match! Oh, where did it come from? I don't know. Oh, only it's a, it's a safety match. I, well, I got to have something to strike it on. <gasps> only ma the match is lit. And it did it all by itself. Oh, not by itself, George. You did it all by yourself. You know what, George? You are wonderful. Perfectly wonderful. <laughs> What a beautiful dinner, George. We, we couldn't have done better if we were dining at Delmonico's with all the swells. Well, the oysters were wonderful, if I do say so myself. Mm, just think, you made this dinner happen. Just for the two of us right here in our own home. You know, when Mike Brannigan told me he guessed I would have to pay for that broken lamp, I told him, I said, 
<laughs> Mike, mm. you got another guest coming. <laughs> Then what did he say? Well, that he didn't know what kind of a trick I'd pulled, but he was minus one lamp, and he expected me to pay for it. No, oh, forget Mike Brannigan and the lamp. Have another slice of this lovely, sizzling sirloin of beef. Blood rare, just the way you like it. Here, let me pour the water into the glass. Well, why are we drinking water with a dinner like this? This calls for one of those fine imported French wines. How about... Champagne, champagne, of course, champagne it is. <laughs> and there we are, <laughs> an oversized bottle too, yeah. all open and ready to pour. Mm. 1893. Mm. Ah, delicious. Uh, some for you, madame? Oh, it's heaven. Well, maybe we can have some tomorrow night, too. After all, it'll be New Year's Eve. Well, oh, why not? Oh, Minnie, Minnie, I didn't tell you. This morning at the bank, I called a pair of gold and diamond cufflinks into existence. You did? Can I see them? Well, then Mr. Gumshot, the head bookkeeper, came by, snooping as always, and so I quickly willed the cufflinks out of existence. Oh. Al Gumshot would have noticed them and, you know, asked questions. Oh, pity. Well, still... Think of all the nice new things we can have now. Just for the asking, as it were, new clothes, maybe a new place to live. This little wart removed from my nose without surgery. Well, we have to move slowly, Minnie. We don't want anybody to get suspicious. Nobody except the two of us must know about this. Mm, the two of us. And Charlie. You expecting anyone, George? Uh, no. Uh, who, who is it? John Crawford of Crawford, Crawford and Fish, attorneys at law. Mr. McWaiter? George McWaiter? Uh, yes, what can I do for you? You are familiar with our client, Michael Brannigan of Brannigan Saloon? Mike Brannigan, of course. My firm represents Mr. Brannigan in legal matters. Well, what do you have to do with us? Well, last Thursday at about uh, 6 p.m., were you on the premises of Michael Brannigan's saloon? Well, my friend Dempsey and I may have been having a couple of beers. In the course of your visit to Mr. Brannigan's establishment, were you involved in any occurrence that might be considered unusual? Don't answer him, George. It, 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 this is my wife, Mr. Crawford. Wait a minute. What do you mean, unusual? Well, like you're causing in some strange way that no one seems capable of explaining... Causing a lamp that hangs over the bar, a rather expensive lamp, to be turned upside down, and in spite of that, it continued to burn. Are you asking me or telling me? Careful, George. Well, the point is that in some way you caused the lamp eventually to drop to the floor. It was shattered into a hundred pieces. Mr. Brannigan estimates the replacement cost of that lamp at a minimum of $37.50. Now, look, if either you or Brannigan thinks for one moment that I intend to replace that lamp... Or pay $37.50. Exactly, Mrs. McWaiter. Then you both got another think coming. Do you deny that you had anything to do with the lamps falling and breaking? I wish you a very good evening, Mr. Crawford. Careful, you don't fall down the stairs. Well, if that is your attitude, Mr. McWaiter, I shall look forward to seeing you in court. You will never see me in any court, Mr. Crawford. I'll see you in hell first. George! What happened? Where is Mr. Crawford? Oh, oh, he vanished. Just like that. One minute he was here, and the next, nothing. Just air. Remember the last thing you said to us? Certainly. Before he got to see me in any court on account of Brannigan's lamp, I said that I would first see him in a... Minnie, do you suppose... Oh, I wouldn't know. You're the miracle worker, George. Not me. <laughs> One of our great writers once said, Things that are mysterious are not necessarily miracles. Few of us would quarrel with that. But another one wrote, A miracle is an event described by those to whom it was told, by men who did not see it. As your storytelling host, that puts me in a somewhat awkward spot, doesn't it? 
I shall return shortly with Act Two. Whatever the subject, you can be sure that William Shakespeare had something to say about it. Miracles? In one of his plays, her English captors accused Joan of Arc of using evil and vicious devices to work what she calls miracles. She answers, to work exceeding miracles on earth, I never had to do with wicked spirits. And it is this very thought that his miraculous powers may in some way be tainted with evil that is now on the mind of George McWhorter. George, this is certainly a crazy way to spend a cold, chilly Sunday morning sitting out here in all this fog. Oh, the fog will lift, Charlie, sooner or later. It, it, it just helps to take my mind off things. George, you're taking all this much too seriously. Charlie, you don't realize last night I sent a man to hell. To hell, Charlie. Well, good riddance from what you told me about him. Charlie, I don't have the right to do that. But you do have the power. You're the man who can... Don't, 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 don't say it, Charlie. Things are moving a little too fast for me. I'm not very happy about the whole thing. Hey, I got an idea. What? Why can't you use your willpower, if you feel that bad about it, to bring this Crawford character back from uh, wherever you think you sent him? Oh, Charlie, I tried. I, I concentrated everything. No good? Yeah, that's why I'm down in the dumps. Nothing happened. Here, here, look at this morning's headlines. New York attorney missing. Mysterious disappearance. John Crawford of the legal firm of Crawford, Crawford and Fish. Hey, wait just one minute. Now, I may not have the answer, but I just thought of someone who might. Uh, uh, who? Mr. Howell. Well, who's that? Uh, Francis Chatterton Howell, the famous minister of that church on the Bowery. Everybody knows uh, that was him. Well, what could he do? Well, he's a very bright man. He, he can never tell. Something like miracles might just be right up his alley. Uh, are you comfortable, Mr. McWhirt? Uh, warm enough? <laughs> this chapel does get a bit drafty at times. Oh, I, I, I'm just fine, Reverend Howell. Just fine, thank you. Now, uh, <clears throat> exactly what, Mr. McWhirt, seems to be your problem? Well, you won't believe me when I tell you that... Uh, look, would you believe, Reverend Howell, that an ordinary, common person, take me, for instance, sitting right here in your chapel, could have some kind of funny twist inside him that made him able to do things just by his own willpower? Oh, indeed I would. Things that nobody else could do? The individual man is the end of the universe. As the poet Walt Whitman said, I celebrate myself and sing myself. And what I assume... No, no, I, I, I don't think you quite understand, Reverend. Maybe I could show you. Show me? If, if you'll allow me to make free with something in this room by, by way of sort of an experiment. Well, help yourself. All right. Now... Take this tobacco jar on the table, for instance. Oh, that's quite interesting, isn't it? It's a gift from a devoted parishioner. Please keep your eye on it, sir. Tobacco jar, be a bowl of violets. What lovely violets. But I don't understand. How, how did you do that? Are you some sort of professional magician? What's the trick? There's no trick. Now watch this one. Bowl of violets change into a glass fish bowl with goldfish swimming in it. Go! It's amazing. Absolutely extraordinary. Is this how you make your living, Mr. McWhorter? Oh, oh, no. No, I'm a bookkeeper by profession. Do you suppose you could turn this fish bowl back into what it was? My tobacco jar? Dear Tobacco Jar. Oh, thank you. May, may, may I ask what your fee would be for an evening? Uh, you still don't understand, Reverend, what you have just seen. Yes. That is part of my problem. What? I can't explain it. But you've just seen it for yourself. Those were miracles. Miracles? Yes. I can get just about everything I wish for, if I wish hard enough, with 
just a few exceptions. You mean what I've been witnessing is not a skillful exhibition of ledger domain, of sleight of hand, of magic. Reverend Howell, it all began with an oil lamp at Mike Brannigan's saloon. And now my biggest problem is that I wished a young fellow into hell. Name's John Crawford. You did what? Into hell. I wasn't really thinking a slip of the tongue more than anything else. And no sooner were the words out of my mouth than he just disappeared. I tried to get him back, but my powers seem to be limited. They, they, they don't go quite that far. Oh, I need your help, Reverend. It, 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 it's on my conscience. Oh, this is truly amazing. If what you say is so, and I have no plausible reason to doubt you, well, after what I've seen you do, there's no question you have a gift. A very rare gift indeed. Well, I, I wouldn't know about that, Reverend. I'm, uh, I don't think you have anything to worry about. How's that? Well, there's not the slightest touch of criminality to what you've done to this Mr. Crawford. So, if you don't mind, I would like to leave the difficulties of Crawford just for the time being and concentrate on the possibilities of somewhat uh, larger issues. I don't follow you, Reverend. Well, suppose there were a way to rescue dozens, nay, hundreds of poor condemned souls from the hell in which they dwell. Now, wouldn't that, in a way, make up for the one man whom you say you have already put there? And for whom, apparently, there seems to be no return? I, I, I wouldn't know. But then, why don't we try to find out? How? Put on your hat and coat. Well, where are we going, Reverend Howell? Run down the street to the Bowery, Mr. McWhirter, uh, to meet some of my neighbors. <laughs> Reverend Howell. Oh, Francis Chatterton Howell from the church around the corner. Oh, that Reverend Howell. Listen, if you're going to try again to get me into your church... No, you first, just... first, oh. I'd like you to sit up if you can from the position you're lying in in that doorway. Well, I'll try, Reverend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, there. How's that? Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. I would like you to meet a friend of mine, George McWhirter. This is Tex. Uh, how are you, Tex? Oh, I ain't complaining, I'm Reverend McWhirter. Uh, just Mr. McWhirter. Uh, Tex. Uh, Tex, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Now, you know me long enough, Reverend, to know I ain't. Wouldn't you like to be something other than what you are? No, I don't reckon so. <laughs> Fellas like me don't change much. <laughs> Would you, Mr. McWhirter here, care to join me in a little nip out of this bottle to celebrate New Year that's coming up tonight? Yep, yep, yep. No, 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 thank you. Takes. Yeah. Suppose it were possible to change. Suppose I were to tell you that Mr. McWhirter here could help you this very minute. I how? Uh, what you aiming to do? Mr. McWhirter, you told me you changed water to wine. Do you suppose you could work it in reverse? Here's looking at both of you. Wine to water. Go. <laughs> oh, what in darnation happened to my drink? Just wait on water. Oh, great, great. We're doing oh, fine. Oh, when I cast ugly coyote to dump now, this Now, here comes the big one, Mr. McWhirter. Uh, the big one? Make him sober. Give him a shave, a haircut, a bath, new clothes, a little money in his pocket, and an entirely new attitude toward life. Uh, just, just, just let me concentrate for a second. And what are you two whispering about? Go ahead, Mr. McWhirter. All right. Now. Go. <sighs> It's worked. His hair is cut. He's clean. And I think he's sober. Well, what is this? I can't figure what's happened. Uh, what am I doing sitting here on the sidewalk in these new store clothes? Uh, 
When and how? Uh, yesterday. What time does services at your church begin? In half an hour. Uh, well, if you gentlemen will excuse me, I'm going to mosey across the street and have myself a bit of breakfast. Oh, I'll uh, see you in church, Reverend. Oh, we have done it, Mr. McWhorter. We've done it. Now, doesn't this make up a little for what happened to you, Mr. Crawford? Well, I, I must say, I, I don't feel quite so bad about Crawford a after this. Just think of where we can go from here. The possibilities are endless. Endless? With your help, every lost soul in the world can be redeemed. You can spread joy, goodness, happiness all over the face of the globe. Now, slow down a minute, Reverend. You're going a little too fast for me. In fact, everything's going a little too fast. I, I, I just can't keep up. We can start the first thing tomorrow morning. On New Year's Day? So soon? Tomorrow is the beginning of a new century, the 20th. Imagine what better way to start it. Reverend Howell, you'll have to excuse me. I've got to get home to my wife. I have the feeling I'm going to celebrate the new year like it's never been celebrated before. <laughs> once said a miracle is simply an event that creates faith. Then the only fraud in the world is the event that does not encourage or foster belief. With his faith in his power to perform miracles, just what is George McWhorter planning to do? We'll see what he's up to when I return shortly with Act Three. One of his plays, Shakespeare has a character say, That man has done a miracle today. A second character responds, True, he's made the lame to leap and fly away. To which a third answers, But you have done more miracles than I. You made in a day, my lord, whole towns to fly. If George McWhorter had read those words, uh, But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. At the moment... George, with his wife and best friend Charlie, are about to ring in the new year. Happy New Year, George! <laughs> Happy New Year, Charlie! Well, you're a little early, Minnie. It's only 10 to 12. Oh, what's the difference? Let's drink this wonderful champagne you wished for us, George. It's <laughs> 1900. Happy New Century to both of us. Oh, well, thank you, Charlie. But you know, I just can't face the idea of a 20th century. Or a century, George, if there ever was one. You still worrying about that Crawford fellow? Well, forget him. He meant you no good anyway. Drink your champagne. But you don't understand either of you. It's not only Crawford. I just can't keep up with all that's happening. Everything's going too fast. This, this new power I have. It, it, it scares me. You know what you mean. Well, have another glass of champagne, George. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. I just may need it. <laughs> Cheer up. According to my watch, we only got about eight minutes to midnight and the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Let's think about a happy new year. You want to know something? I couldn't care less if I see this century or not. George, what are you saying? You see that full moon out the window there? Yes. It's beautiful. It reminds me of a story that used to fascinate me when I was a kid in Sunday school. Remember the story of Joshua in the Bible? Mm, can't say I do. Well, Joshua made the sun stand still right in the middle of the heavens, and the moon, too. And for a whole day and a whole night, they both just hung in the sky without moving. I think you're trying to tell us something, George. Well, what I'm trying to say is, Suppose I was to try to do the same kind of thing. You mean, make the sun stop? And the moon? Better than that. Suppose I was to stop the whole world from turning around. You mean stop the Earth from rotating? Well, whatever you call it, what would happen? Wouldn't everything stop moving so fast? Wouldn't time stop work? Just might. I, how would I know? And we could stay right here in the 19th century, and I wouldn't have to be bothered with a lot of new things I don't like. Uh, George, we only got a few minutes to go. Well, I wouldn't be doing anybody any harm, would I? If I stopped the world from turning around? Oh, it's a pretty large order, George. Less than one minute till midnight. Well, here goes. 
world, I want you to stop. Uh, uh, what was that word, Minnie? Rotating. George, are you sure? World, stop rotating this very minute. Oh, hold on to everything, both of you. I don't quite know what I've done, but whatever it is, it's bigger than all of us. What did I do? I'm flying head over heels like a bullet out of a gun. Flying through space. I can't catch my breath. Everything's so black. And everything's whirling about me like a mile a minute. Pieces of broken furniture. Blocks of houses crashing all around me. Branches of trees. Ah! Where's Minnie? And Charlie? Oh, good Lord! What on earth have I done? Charlie, where are you? What have I done? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What am I worrying about? I forgot. I can do anything I want. Concentrate. Concentrate, George. Concentrate. I want to come down into some quiet place. Whatever else happens, I want to get down. And I want Minnie and Charlie to be with me wherever they are. on the soft earth. I wonder where I am. George? George? Oh, are you all right? Are you hurt? Oh, Minnie. Minnie, I, I think I'm all right. How about you? What? George? George, what, what went wrong? A minute ago, it was a fine night with the moon shining, and, and now, uh, well, where, where are we? There's a house and all our things. I don't know, Minnie. I can't see much. It's all so dark. Oh, the wind keeps screaming, blowing like a gale. Oh, what a... What a mess I've made of everything. Ah, I think I know what's happened. What? what? I remember from my high school course in science. The Earth spins around in space at about a thousand miles an hour. At the equator. George, what's that got to do with us? In New York, it's about half that. About about 500 miles an hour. So? So that's something like uh, uh, eight miles a minute. And when I stop the Earth from... Uh, from uh, rotating? What? Oh, yes, rotating, rotating. Charlie. It was just like you were on your streetcar, don't you see? And suddenly you jammed on the brakes for some reason, and all the passengers would get thrown forward, wouldn't they? Then, no, no, you mean when you, uh, so to speak, jammed the brakes on the earth and made it stop turning? Uh, everything that was sitting on top of the earth got thrown forward? Everything. Everybody shoved right out into space. And that's where I think we are now. But everything in the world smashed the bit. What's more, probably everybody. George, do you realize what you've done? Oh, I know, Minnie, I know. George, there is no world. You've just destroyed the whole thing. I know. And we may be the only three human beings left in the entire universe. <laughs> I feel terrible. Perfectly terrible. Look at my dress. It looks as if it was singed. And my suit? As if it didn't start to burn? I think it did, Charlie. Really? I, I guess that the, 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 the friction of going through space nearly set all of us on fire. George, what are we going to do? We just can't stay here forever, crouching on all fours this way. Oh, and that roaring wind is never that soft. Isn't that the truth? Oh, I have messed things up. You certainly have, George. But I have an idea. Mm. It better be good. Now, wait. If I could get us out here in the first place... You think maybe you could work it in reverse? I could try. And we wouldn't be any worse off than we are now. But it didn't work with that fellow Crawford. You miracled him all the way to hell. You couldn't get him back. Don't remind me. Well, it's worth a try. Only for heaven's sake. Be careful this time, George. We don't want things to get any worse. I've got my fingers crossed. And I'm concentrating with everything I've got. George, I... I shh, shh, quiet. I want the world to go on turning just as it did before. I want everybody and everything in it to be just as they were before I started this whole thing. 
I want time to go on as it always did, as if it had never stopped. George, George I... George, interrupt him, Charlie. I want everybody to remember nothing about the whole stupid thing. Absolutely nothing. And more than anything else. What's that, George? That will have to be my own personal secret. Go! There. Only four o'clock and look how dark it is already. Well, it's that time of the year, George. Ah. Have I got time to walk over to Mike Brannigan's uh, before dinner's ready, Minnie? To wish all your friends good luck on this first day of the three years. Huh? Of course. Dinner won't be ready before six. Well, if Charlie's there, I might just shoot the breeze with him for a while. Maybe play our little match game? Help yourself, George. Only don't be late for dinner. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, can I invite you to celebrate the first day of the new year with a little cheer right out of this here little old bottle? Well, that's very <laughs> kind of you, but I'm in a hurry to meet a friend of mine at Brannigan. Oh, well, I understand. Well, happy... Hey, do I know you from any place? I don't think so, my friend. I don't think so. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm very sorry, sir. All my fault. I just wasn't looking where I was going. That's perfectly all right. No harm done. Now, here, let me pick up your pipe. Ah, well, I'm so glad it didn't break. Oh, thank you so much. May, may, may I ask, uh, do you happen to live anywhere in this neighborhood? Well, just a couple of blocks from here. Well, I'm conducting a special service this evening at my church, the one around the corner... The beginning of a new century, you know. I uh, I invite you to drop in. I think you will find it interesting. Well, uh, thank you ever so much, Reverend uh, Howell Francis Chatterton Howell. The Francis Chatterton Howell. <laughs> the very same. Haven't we met some place before? <laughs> Sorry, Charlie, you lose again. It's the match in the middle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Two more beers, Mike. Charlie's paying, as usual. I can't figure out how you do it. It's, it's almost like some kind of miracle. Miracle? Ah, there's no such thing. Look, Charlie, if someone was to come along, say me, for instance, stand right about here mm -hmm. and tell you he could make that oil lamp up there turn upside down, and that it would go on burning without any kind of an accident. What would you say? Well, that nothing would happen. And just to prove that to you, uh, watch this now. Lamp, turn upside down. There. You see? Nothing. Which proves what? Oh, George. Yes? Uh, that red-faced fellow coming towards us, you, you know him? I uh, never saw him before in my life. But may I have the pleasure of buying you two gentlemen a drink in the spirit of the new year? Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Very much obliged, I'm sure. I see you're drinking beer. A uh, couple of beers, bartender. Cole Weller up here is quite a change from where I've just come from. Uh, where, might I ask, was that? A long way from here. It must have been way down south someplace with that sunburn you got. Well, that's, uh, that's not really a sunbite. No. Now, where I've been, I, I guess you might call it way, way, way down south. I don't think I quite caught your name. Where's Crawford? John Crawford. Of the law firm of Crawford, Crawford, and Fish. We uh, handle most of Mike Brannigan's legal work. Oh, is that so? Well, now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'll have to be running along. Uh, we've never met before, have we? Uh, I don't think so, uh, but uh, thank you for the drink. Uh, my pleasure. And a happy new year to you. <laughs> nice fellow. Uh, George, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, yes? Uh, before this Crawford came by, we were talking about miracles, and you said there was no such thing, right? Right. 
Now, suppose, uh, just suppose for argument's sake, that you had the power to work a miracle. Uh, Charlie, if I ever did have such a power, I still wouldn't be able to work any miracles. Why is that? Because if I ever had such a power, the first thing I'd do would be to pass a miracle taking away from me the power to work any more miracles. You would, George? I did, Charlie. We began this story by saying that a miracle, by dictionary definition, is something wonderful. A departure from the usual course of nature. And yet, isn't it possible that we are surrounded by miracles every minute of the day, every day of our lives. Not George McWhorter's kind of miracle, but wonders that are a part of nature, like the rising of the sun, the growth of a blade of grass, the first steps taken by a child. In fact, the miracle of life itself. I'll be back shortly. More than 75 years ago, H.G. Wells became the father of modern science fiction by writing a brilliant succession of short stories and novels dealing with such subjects as a man who could make the world stop turning. Since then, more than a few of us who have found life on this planet somewhat less than satisfactory have at one time or another said, Stop the world. I want to get off. Next time you're tempted... Think twice. For all you know, you may have the gift of working miracles. Our cast included William Redfield, Marion Haley, Russell Horton, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.